So <clears throat> I was saying that today we're going to have a conversation about trematodes and cestodes, but the focus of today's uh, session will be to help you identify uh, different features of different cestodes and trematodes, uh, including their, their um, life stages, some of their life cycles, uh, some of the distincting features of these particular uh, worms and and to help you if you see them under microscope um, to be able to know or even you see them in real life you'll be able to identify them and differentiate them so it's mainly some form of a revision for you uh, to get a slightly better understanding so we'll be talking about the cestodes which are tapeworms and we'll be talking about trematodes which are also known as flukes flukes they're like um uh, leaves all right, so getting into it is the trematodes and the cestodes are like two different groups. And the cestodes can be generally grouped in cyclophilidase and pseudophilidase and then other cestodes. So in the cyclophilidase, you have the likes of tinias and iconococcus to name a few examples. Uh, this time we'll cover sagnata and uh, tinea solium. And then you have pseudophilidase like D. latum, uh, it's another one. And then you have other cestodes like Menelipis nana and Dipolidium uh, as, as parts of the cestodes. But in the parts of trematodes, we have some blood flukes looking things like schistosomes, like schistosome mansoni, japonicum, hematobium. Mm -hmm. We have yeah. intestinal flukes that we, we talked about yesterday. Uh, like Phalaeostelopsis buski, heterophyes, heterophyes, gastrodiscoides, um, and, and uh, echinostoma, and the likes of such. And then you have lung flukes that I think you've already spoken about, like Paragonimus westermani. And then you have liver flukes that we've already talked about yesterday, like uh, Fasciola hepatica, uh, and others. Um, I would like you guys to mute your microphones. Mm -hmm. Hmm? Right, so starting with the psychophilides, uh, the tinea, tiniasis, and iconococcus as a few examples. So there will be a series of images to help you identify different features of these um, parasites. The tinea, starting with the tinea, uh, sagnata, and uh, tinea solium. This is a the image of a tapeworm right here, and this is the eggs. The eggs have um, prominent striated uh, radius, it has radio striations. These radio striations of the oncosphere, you can see them on the shells. So they're like different lines coming out on the shells. These are radio striations, which are diagnostic feature for, for um, these uh, tinias. An example, another one here, we have uh, uh, Sister Secus of Tinea Solium, which is here. This is another example, um, an image of a, of a Sister Secus, and you probably remember this from the discussion of neurocysticycosis uh, when uh, these parasites are formed. So this could be an example of a sac that has a, a Sister Secus uh, inside there. And on your right hand, on the left hand side, you can see a, a long tapeworm. They could be pretty, pretty long. And this is an example of a, of a, of a tapeworm. So the distinctive features, you need to remember there's a two layered embryo four that has prominent radio striations will be a, will be a, a, a tinea. And, and the eggs of a tinea sagnata and a tinea solium, they, as you've seen in the previous image, uh, they would measure up to 31 micrometers. They have thick striated shell, but also they have typical um, these that are known as um, hex heg, hexacanth embryo. These are some form of, uh, of uh, hooklets. You could be able to appreciate them here. They look like hooklets. This is uh, uh, the three pairs of hooklets. This is a typical for, for the, um, the oncosphere of uh, tinea saginata or solum and uh, solium. And then eggs can be infective to kettles like pork as well as to man as an infective stage. But then there's an important distinction between tinea solium and tinea saginata. Uh, in, in terms of the shape uh, of the head, or, or rather known as the scolex. 
So tinea solium has this additional uh, uh, rostellum hooks, while tinea saginata does not have the rostellum uh, um, armed with hooks. So you can see the difference here. This is tinea solium, the tinea saginata does not have uh, the hooks um, in, in that context. But then they all have uh, four suckers and Cytinia saginata is slightly longer than Tinea solium. Um, and then moving forward, With another one, uh, it's uh, this is another feature that differentiates the tinea soliums and tinea saginata. You can see this is a, an actual image, electron microscope imaging of that. So you should be able to, if you see with the four suckers without the rostellum, this is uh, typical of a saginata. Uh, and then this tinea solium, it has four suckers with. Uh, and that with the row uh, of uh, hooks. And then if you go again, when you want to examine this further in terms of the proglottils, uh, the, in, in, in the, in the, they don't have, the different numbers in, in uterine branches. So the solium has less number of uterine branches, seven to 13, but then saginata has more branches uh, of uterine branches. And in this case, uterine branches, this is a body. And then you have all these are uterine branches. So these are much more in the context of um, tinea saginata than tinea uh, solium. So you could remember uh, it, when it comes to uterine branches, solium has an L, L is less number of uh, uterine branches. It could help you remember these uh, things. So this is mainly the, the uh, images when you have to look about, when you look under a microscope, when you have to be able to see it in, in, in real life. It's unfortunate we're not able to see them under a microscope together. Now, um, another one is a kind of caucus. Now, remember, you already previously studied um, this in terms of the, what disease it causes and what uh, pathology, uh, how, how to treat and things like that. You need to remember that we're going to have a set of questions later on to discuss that. Echinococcus is slightly smaller in terms of it has uh, like about three proglottids uh, and after a scolex, so he has a scolex here, the adult version, and then this is the first proglottid, and then the second one, and then this is the third one. There's, it only contains one mature proglottid that, that has um, contains all the uterus and, and other uh, reproductive organs. So you need to be able to identify that. But then unfortunately the eggs of the of the of this um, uh, uh, parasite are, are not easily distinguishable of agonococcus are not distinguishable from other tinies. So it will be something similar to so if you see an egg like this, it could be um tinea, tiny egg or it could be a um, uh, Echinococcus egg. But the main distinguishing characteristic is that this one has many, as fewer number of, of proglottids compared to, to uh, the tinids. And again, the scolex, it has four suckers and an armed rostellum. But the difference, how it looks between this one and the previous, uh, when the other tinids, that is, has armed rostellum, the shape looks slightly different, right? This one is, is, projected outside, but it looks slightly different with the other one. So, and then the other component, which is important for echinococcus is the hydatid cyst, right? So they usually have this so-called protoscolysis. This is an example of a protoscolex that is evaginated. That means all the rostellum is inside. These are the hooks in the rostellums. But then the other one that are, this is invaginated, this is evaginated. Right, so these are hydrated sand or hydrated um, cysts. That is, uh, you would in this is hydrated sand that you would find in a hydrated cyst. Right, so this is a we would be able to differentiate um, uh, this too. So this is a typical image of a hydrated sand. 
right? Uh, the other features and distinction characteristics, you've already discussed them in the previous um, lectures, uh, as in what disease it causes and, and how to manage this. Now, talking about pseudophilidase, which is things like D. latum, which is a fish tapeworm. Uh, this is slightly different. Um, the eggs are, uh, have, are operculated. I remember yesterday we were talking about operculums. So this is an operculum, and they have an, a knob here. There's a little knob here, uh, and, and they're usually are unembryonated. So an embryo is underdeveloped when the egg is released from the uterus and must complete its development uh, to coracidium stage uh, in fresh water. So this is an example where the uh, opaculum is, comes out and this, this, it comes out and develops uh, to coracidium in fresh water. So this is an example of um, D. latum egg. And this is the D. latum itself. This is the head or rather the scolex as they would like to call it. Different from the tinids, if you remember, the tinids have round suckers, um, but this one, these are the suckers are like grooves. They are grooves like this. Different from the ones that you've seen in, in the tinids. So the groove-like suckers are the diatherobotium latums, and you could see them also here. They would find a way to attach themselves. And the matured properties compared to the uterus, of if you want to remember, these are the uterus of uh, Echinococcus and, and other tinies like this. They look branched and, and, uh, and highly branched, but for the D. latum, uh, it looks like a rosette. So they are like rosette formation uh, uh, and, and they're the center of a proglotid. So these are distinguishing features. So when you think about the distinguishing features of this, uh, the stapeworm, um, you think about the the suckers, and you think about the uterus, and, and the fact that their uterus are prosette shaped. Okay. And they're relatively smaller. This is another um, uh, uh, image under a microscope. This is a stained image. Now, why do we have the copepod here? The copepod uh, is the first intermediate host of Diphthalobotrium latum. And these copepods could be different types, but they're mainly also known as cyclops or copepods or they are type of crustaceans. They have typical uh, features that you will see the cyclops because they have one eye or eye-like shape. And, and they are, um, the others are like tick shape like and others. So all these are crustaceans. So this is an image of a copepod, which is uh, an, an important intermediate host for the Philobotrium latum. And this is an important feature, partly because you would, if you filter your water and things like that, you can get rid of these, uh, these crustaceans that are responsible for the transmission. And then, so after that, we talk about cestodes. Cestodes, we have um, Hemolipis nana uh, and uh, Diphilidium in our context. So the dwarf tapeworm is a small tapeworm, as like a known adult is, is relatively smaller. And you can see the head and the rostellum look um, kind of like uh, uh, what you would have um, with, uh, with uh, the other tapeworms, but the rostellum is retractable into the sac. So this difference is this rostellum, it can, go back inside and be retractable. I think I've shown you the other images uh, of how it can also come inside and come outside. So it's sort of flexible, this rostellum that is uh, armed with hooks. But also um, this is how the uterus um, look like in mature progotids. They are not, uh, they are not uh, branched, they're not highly branched. They're also somehow rosette-like formation, just like when we were seeing um, in the previous um, tape room. So this is how you would imagine to see uh, uh, um, uh, this particular table. And once you see this, some of the questions that would be to, for you to identify, uh, you know, what disease is caused by this, how do you treat it, and, and what's the control measure. Now, Hemolipis nana, 
uh, can, if you look at the eggs, uh, we discussed it before, the eggs have a typical uh, polar filament. And I, if you remember the previous lecture, we had talked about these polar filaments um, that would go all around uh, this uh, parasite. So this is an image of the Melipis nana egg. And these polar filaments would be the distinguishing feature between Hemilipis nana and Hemilipis diminuta. Right, the Hemilipis diminuta does not have these polar filaments. And if you ask me why, this is because this is the biology and how it was, they were made. And this is the distinction features between Hemilipis nana and, and, and Hemilipis diminuta. And the, the, the cystocycloid can hardly be distinguished. They look almost the same. Um, and then when you look at the, the other features in terms of the number of membrane, the number of hooklets, hexacanth hooklets, um, they are, these are six hooklets. They also have, a, eggs are very transparent. But the diminutor one is red, the eggs is much more yellow colored compared to, to the Hemolipis nana, as you can see in these images. So, um, Nana has polar filaments, diminuta does not have uh, polar filaments, but they both have hexacanth uh, uh, hooklets. I hope you're able to follow. And we're going to have questions later to discuss um, these issues. Now, D caninum, uh, this is the palladium caninum, which are typical for dogs, and they have. Uh, eggs that are laid in packets of five to 15 eggs or more. Uh, and this is, this is a typical feature for, for uh, the caninum eggs. These are the only ones that I think will have laid their eggs in packets, but also um, they are rostellum, just like what we were seeing in the previous presentation. There is, the rostellum is usually retracted inside, but it also is hooked. It has hooks like this. Uh, and then, but it's not like the ones that we've seen here that are evaginated, but can come in and out. This one is the, all the time they are retracted inside. And they have typically this feature of um, lateral genital pores. The genital pores are lateral and uh, they are very elongated longer and they look like sometimes they call like vase flowers. This is, you see them longer, this is different from what you're seeing before, these are slightly shorter. And uh, even others are slightly shorter, right? So for the, the caninum are usually longer, right? So that's, that's, those are the features we're seeing. But now the next slides, after finishing this, we're going to have, um, a uh, discussion where we'll allow you to even unmute your mic and say some of these things and I, I could probably call you out. So to identify what you're seeing, what are the diagnostic features or why do you think that is a parasite and then how can it be diagnosed and what is the pathogenesis and the definitive intermediate host. So typically when you get questions, they would be around this type of question. We both all those, I'm a one of them, I'm a two of them, or uh, to be able to identify, right? So we're going to start one by one uh, of what we've just studied. Okay, so let's go in the chat. Let's discuss A. What is A? What do you think A is? So in terms of, let's start with identify. What is A? So, all right, people are saying tinea solium, tinea solium. So that's the first question of what identify, right? Identify tinea solium. Now, let's keep going in the chat. Why do you think is a tinea solium? What's the diagnostic feature? What's the diagnostic feature? The rostellum. Aha, uh -huh. rostellum with books. Yes, uh, not scolex. They all have scolex. So scolex is a head, but um, the rostellum with hooked. Great. This is another definition features. Yes. Uh, 
hooks, not four hooks, suckers. So these are suckers, the four suckers with rostellum that is armed. Great. So that's that's a uh, good good responses. Now um, let's go. What is the what is how can you diagnose this? What's the diagnosis? How do you diagnose this? How can you make a diagnosis of this? Uh -huh. Visualization of eggs and feces. All right. Uh, and then um, that's good. So the other one is what is the pathogenesis? What diseases does it cause? It causes what disease does it cause? Tiniasis. All right, great. Um, and then uh, it also could cause cystosis. And then the last part of the question would be uh, what's the definitive uh an intermediate host for this brilliant so we have pigs pigs and humans pigs digress right so <clears throat> and how do you treat it What's the treatment? All right. So this is this is the same thing we will we should be able to do with all these parasites A, B, C, D, and then ongoing up until um, these ones and the end. Right. So for now, what I will do, I'll go ahead with the rest of the of the. Uh, uh, presentation, and then we can come back to that, right? So, okay, before we go, let's do one last identification. Can you identify what is G? Uh, Haimesh is asking, what is D? What is D? What do you think D is? Okay, so oh, fine, fine. Before we do, let's finish G. G is E granulosis. That is an easy one. Why do you think it's is 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 um, E granulosis? What is the diagnostic feature that you have? It has three proglottids, right? So it's typical for that. So you can caucus. right? And what is um, What is J? Yeah, Saidi, I think you've said something very important, uh, mature one. So when you identify, you say adult E granulococcus granulosis or uh, eggs of granulosis, econococcus. So you need to also mention the full name of the stage because sometimes you need to know whether you also know the stage uh, of what you're identifying. So that's also important. Uh, J is a copepode, right? Uh, or is a cyclope or is a, in that context, right? So I think you get the idea, right? So what would F be? Elvod Mbona, you're saying whether, can we say it's a crustacean? I don't think you should say it's a crustacean because also crabs are crustaceans. It's just like saying, um, seeing a, a, a monkey and a human being, and then you also say they're both homo, but homo what? Homo sapiens, homo erectus, homo what? So you can't say crustaceans, just crustaceans. You could, should have to specify a copper pot and that, and in that context, right? All right, so let's say F. F, what is F? Some say it's D-Latum, some say it's H, uh, 
Nana, some say homotestis nana. What is homotestis nana? All right, so what is F? Let's see the chat. What is F? Do you remember? F, Davis, F is not scolex. The scolex is a head. This is not a head. It's a proglottid. So some say it's a proglottid of H nana, some say it's a proglottid of D latum. Okay. Uh, D latum. Okay. Right, so the H nana is slightly different. It's much more trapezoid. So H nana is much more trapezoid, if you remember, right? While uh, the D latum is much more rectangular, right? So remember the difference. The D latum is much more um, rectangular, while H nana is much more trapezoid, okay? Okay, now moving on with others. Okay, so let's let's identify what is number six. What is number six? It's an easy one. These are egg packets of D cannulum. All right, the cunningham egg packets. Great, so that's, that's right. Okay, so it seems like you have an idea of these things. So you should be able to identify them and then the treatment and then what is the, uh, what is the host? All right. Great, it's dogs, it's cunningham, it's in the name, so you should be able to remember this. Okay, so I'm glad that you're able to identify a few of these. Now, moving forward um, with, oh yeah, last one. This is an easy one also. Uh, what do you think four is? What do you think number four is? It has polar filaments, it has uh, hooklets. So some people are saying yeah, the eggs of H nana, right? Great, because as you've seen polar filaments and eggs are can you. And it's also very much more white. Right. While the number five is most likely what? What is number five? Diminuta. Okay, great. So you, you, you're catching on to this. Right. Um, now back to trematodes. These are flukes. Uh, flukes. Flukes can be grouped into blood flukes, intestinal flukes, lung flukes, and liver flukes. Uh, and these are the eggs generally to help you understand how they're differentiated as and their relative size. Um, you could see here, these are the blood flukes, schistosomes, and we can have here the bigger flukes. This is lung fluke, the paragonimus egg. This is liver fluke, the hepatica, and intestinal fluke for the Phaseolopsis busci. And then we have the other intestinal flukes like the metagonimus, heteropias, opistochis, and clinokis. And these are the blood flukes that you're seeing here. The hematobium, mansoni, and the japonicum. 
right? So we're going to see each of these spermatozoans a differentiation, but one of the uh, typical differentiation, you'd have a hematobium that is passed through um, urine, chocho, and then it has a polar pole and the spike, and then this one has a side spike. This was a so smaller knob here. While paragonimus, our eggs are opaculated, together with the fasciola, eggs are opaculated. They have a cap and the fasciola buski has opaculated. They're slightly similar and indistinguishable with each other, uh, but the differences become the sizes. And paragonimus, since it is uh, found in lungs, so you can find it in sputum, while others you can find them in urine and others you can find them in feces, right? So if you remember hepatica and buski and other intestinal ones, there are some there's results are found in, in species. Pargonimus will be in, in uh, saliva because it comes in the lungs. And hematobium will be in urine. The others will be in, in feces. OK, great. So here we are. These are some of the images you could see. Uh, the terminal spine, lateral spine, and the lateral knob for hematobium, japonicum, and mansoline. And uh, the, the, so in microscopic detection, you take urine or uh, stool sample to detect the eggs. This is a very tiny knob. You should be very careful looking at it for you to be able to find it. Um, and uh, this is for all the three. And they're much more spherical, while the hematobium and mansoni, they're usually more oval shape. These kystosomes are transmitted by um, uh, different uh, snails as vectors. And there are three major uh, uh, snail vectors, but there are many other snails available. So there's Bulinus for hematobium, Oncomelania for Japonicum, Biomphalaria for Mansonai. Um, I don't have an acronym of how to remember this. You just have going to, to remember how it is. Uh, maybe hematobium, it has a B. And then bulinus, it has a B. You could try to see how that one works for you. Uh, and then you could think of uh, oncomelania and japonicum. Japonicum has a C and oncomelania has a C. Um, these are typical features you could think around it. And then mansona, you could figure out a way for you to remember. But the differences between these three species is their opening. So Bulinus opens to the left-hand side. What does it mean? It means if you want to enter, you have to enter from the left-hand side, while these other ones, you enter from the right-hand side, right? So that's the differentiation between Bulinus and the Oncomelania. Biomphalaria is much more coiled. So this is another image of them. Uh, you would see on Comelania. I mean, this opens left, and then the other one opens to the right. And then the other one is discoid, etc. Hope that's clear. This is for the vectors. And for the parasite themselves, they have different stages. It could be a mirosidium, it could be a um, the ones that are saccharides, and then you could have schistosomolus. So the mericidium is usually ciliated. You can see here, this is the ciliated mericidium that helps it to, to move for mobility. Um, the saccharii uh, also have a forked tail. And, and this is another one, which is um, uh, schistosomolum. So that was the stage of this parasite. And then when they're adults, this is a typical male and female adult having sex. So um, they are, that's why called adult warm in copula. In copula means that they're having sex. So they're copulating. So this is male and female, uh, male, adult uh, schistosomes in copula. This is what you have. And this is another image of what you would see or uh, known as swimmer's itch uh, or cystosome's point of entry. And this is another um, typical patient with cystosomiasis. Who can tell me what kind of cystosomiasis causes 
this type of presentation. It's in the chat. Uh, why do you say Mansonai? Why do you say Mansonai in Japonicum? Yeah, so because it exists in portal vein and causes distension. So what is this condition called? Ascites, yes, ascites is this accumulation of fluid in the in the um, abdominal cavities. Great, so this is an, an example of that. Thank you very much, Petro, Paolo, Amesh, and, and others for responding. Right, so moving on to other traumatodes, uh, such as the intestinal flukes, lung flukes, and liver flukes. So this is a traumatoid ova, uh, as, as we've seen previously, uh, the opaculated, uh, they are oval-shaped and they can be very distinctive in terms of imagery. And this is the same image that I've shown you just previously uh, for the traumatoids. And starting with uh, intestinal traumatoids, the Fasciolopsis buski, heterophyus, heterophyus, and metagonimus yokogawi. These are the images I will, I will share with you today. Um, So this is Fasciolopsis buski, uh, and who can tell me, we discussed this yesterday, who can tell me what are the distinctive feature of Fasciolopsis buski? Let's go in the chat. Why do you think this is Fasciolopsis buski? Thank you, Frank. You were listening to a presentation yesterday. You said it has no cephalic cone. That is correct. It's, it's differentiating it from the liver fluke, but it is also leaf-shaped. It is bilaterally symmetrical. Um, it has branched uterus and it has terminal testes. All right. Okay. Um, again, this is hydrophytes. If who remembers. Uh, yeah, that also has a ventral sucker. Great, this is a ventral sucker. All right, the hydrophytes. If we were discussing yesterday, we said, uh, what are the two heterophytes? Or that look similar? Who are the two heterophytes that look similar? Elia Muta is saying it opsistrochis, not really. So heterophyus, heterophyus, yes. What is the second one that looks like it? It has a Japanese like name. Yes, Mohoja, Metagonimus Yokogawi. Um, that is that is right. So these are Metagonimus, okay, Sam, it's not Heterophyus Yokogawi. 
is metagonymous to Hypogawi. Both those two are known as heterophytes and they look similar in terms of that. Lovmat, you have a question, you raise your hand. And who can tell me if they remember the difference between, the slight difference between metagonymous, Yokogawi and Etrophias? It has something to do with the ventral sucker. This ventral sucker here. The alignment of the Yes, ventrosaca is on the right of the midline. Thank you, Frank and Anthony. That is correct. The ventrosaca is the right of the midline for metagonema Sukugawi. Okay, great. So that's that's uh, that's that's what we wanted to share with you with these parasites, um, the eggs and the images, the lung trematode, Paragonema swastermani. This usually looks like a coffee bean. Uh, so if you see something that looks like a coffee bean. Uh, for those people who know coffee beans, this is, um, is Paragonimus westermani, which is also known as a lung trematode. And, and it's, it's large, robust, it has, it is ovoid. And then it has a very interesting bilateral symmetry between the two sides. And it has also an oral sucker here. This is the oral sucker. And it takes things out of the poop comes out here. So the oral sucker and the excre excretory bladder, it has its testicles. Yeah, um, it also has, so these are the testicles. It also has its uterus and some ovaries, right? So it has a little ventral sucker here. If you could be able to appreciate it, just like what you see the labeling in this side. Right, and so where do we expect to get the 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 samples of Paragonimus westermani? Is it in a stool sample or in a blood sample or where? Sputum, sputum, yes. All right, good. Great, so now, next one is liver trematodes. So liver trematodes, include the fasciola hepatica, the gigantica, uh, and um, clonorchis sinensis, or pithorchis also included. All right, so um, as you can see, these are the distinguishing features of, of, of fasciola hepatica. How does a person get infected with fasciola hepatica? How can someone get infected with fasciola hepatica? Uh, Hamisi, you are saying raw fish, that is not right. Uh, Lucy is saying eating contaminated aquatic plants. Uh, Shamshad is saying eating contaminated aquatic, aquatic plants. Aquatic plant with metasecaria. Frank's answer is much more accurate. Eating undercooked water plants with metasecaria. That is how complete your answer should be. So that you, uh, you, you mentioned that um, where is it found? And what stage is it going to be at? That's more accurate. So if you answer just eating watercress plant, you might get half a max. But if you answer it fully, you get much more full max. All right. Right. So 
These are the features, as you can see, that it has an oral sucker, uh, it has a pharynx, a uterus, it has um, testicles are here, and it is very long and has branches of intestinal sucker. This is how it looks like, and it has a cephalic cone, typical of fasciola hepatica, different from the Fasciolopsis kuski. Uh, someone asking me, what about undercooked meat? Um, no, it's aquatic plants. So Hamish is asking, where is the cephalic cone? So here, this is what is known as cephalic cone. This, the head is much more protruded compared to, if you look at um, this one, the head is sort of protruded, but it does not have many, much more prominent shoulders. So with that one, is it should be like this. And this, but this is Fasciolopsis Puski. Okay, so this is the difference. I hope you, you appreciated it. And then we have our two twins, the Clonocris sinensis and Opistocris bivarini. Um, the one of the major differences between these two guys are the alignment of the testes. The Clonocris sinensis, the testes are aligned tandem to each other. While the Opisocus viverini, the testes are aligned oblique to each other. Okay. But otherwise, most of the other features are quite similar between these two um, parasites. All right. Now, trematodes. Let's go. What is A, B, C, D? Let me see in the chat. Can you identify A, B, C, D? Write A is this, B is this, C is this, D is this. And maybe write A is this because of this. B is this because of this. C is this because of this. D is this because of this. Let's go. We have five minutes. Okay, keep them coming, keep them coming. You have two minutes. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. One more minute. Try to make sure you put all your uh, four answers in one chat. What is A? Why? What is B? Why? What is C? Why? What is D? Why? And then post it.
Great. So I can see you can think right now. So you can also go back and refer to these answers. I like all your responses uh, and the engagement. Uh -huh. Nice. Um, so you will refer to this later also. Great. Moving forward, and then you have to think now about what is the uh, what pathologies do they cause? What complications? So, quick question: What is the complications for uh, fasciolopsis um, fasciola hepatica? What's the complication for fasciola hepatica, and how are you going to treat it? liver abscess, bile duct obstructions. Hafsa, intestinal obstruction is not very common with fasciola hepatica. It's much more related to the bile duct obstruction, uh, liver anemia issues, um, also, you know, uh, liver cancer and things like that. Live, yeah, someone raised their hand. I don't know who is it. Um, do you want to say something? No? Okay, great. Moving on. Let's go. Um, can you identify for me what is A? And why do you think what that is A? Thank you for your comprehensive answer, Samshad. Why do you say it is egg of S. Mansoni? Bovan, great. You say S. Mansoni because of lateral spine. Right. And where do you think this, this uh, histological tissue is from? From portal veins. All right. Okay, so let's go. What is C? What is C and why? Dixon, not cholestasis. You don't, you would not expect. Um, uh, sorry. Uh huh. Let's go with C. What is C? Dixon, are you responding C as cholecystitis, or that was a different answer? Ah, C is uh, japonicum because of the small lateral knob, knob-like spine. Uh, Elias, e, e is a snail. C is not a snail. C is an egg. So biomphalaria is not the right answer for C. So yes, this is Japonicum um, because it has a small knob here. So that means you can also identify D and the ciliated miracidium um, here. And this is a curry, which is D, and this is a snail. What snail is this responsible for transmitting? E. Bamphalaria gabbata, transmitting S. Mansona. Right. Great. So now, going on, what is number one? So let's say identify one, two, three, four. Another easy one.
What is one, two, three, four? So don't write one, that's like one answer, or oh, put all your four answers and then post. Don't post one, one, one. So like one is two, three, four, and then post the whole thing and complete. Okay, let's keep going with that. Uh -huh, let's see what so people are saying schizosoma adults so it is uh, two adults not one adult so schizosoma adults uh, in copula so they're having sex and then the other ones number two is Phacelops busky because it does not have a cephalic cone and the rest uh, the other one is sinensis and um Phaceola hepatica as number three great Now, uh, we're gonna wind up with a bit of a summary of life cycles of these parasites, because this is a potential conversation point. Uh, so this is uh, a life cycle of Hemelipis nana. Uh, who can unmute their microphone and walk us through this, um, this life cycle? Uh, let me choose one person. Um, Shamshad, can you unmute your microphone and then walk us through um, this, this life cycle? You can't. Ashamshad, are you there? Okay, Celestino Peter, can you unmute your microphone and then walk us through this life cycle? Oh, you can speak in public. All right, anyway, so um, you've read about these life cycles before and what, what are the important things are going to be. So you need to remember that through the rodents that I, if you ingest the infect, infected arthropod and the life cycle will end up giving your eggs in the, the eggs of the parasite in the pieces, which is a diagnostic stage. And the potential for auto-infection can occur if the parasite remains in the intestines. Uh, and then it can keep going on, on and on and on with reinfection and goes back again. Uh, if it's picked up by insects, insects will be important in the life cycle. For Menopis diminuta, again, um, arthropods are important. Life cycle goes on that. And then if you eat the insect, uh, the parasite gets on into your into your uh, into your uh, intestines. Uh, the gravid progotids come out, release the eggs. Life cycle continues. The oncosphere hatch and penetrate the wall of the insects. You eat them. Life continues. The diagnostic stage would be the um, the eggs that are past the feces. Uh, the infective stage is the insects. And Talking about um, 
these are other uh, parasites that we're looking at. This is most likely an intestinal uh, liver fluke, I think. Uh, I don't know the Im these images. Oh, there's many different. So these are different uh, liver flukes that can be also involved in the life cycle. And uh, we were discussing, I think, yesterday on these stages. So and someone was asking about sporosis and what is radiae. So this is the, how it goes. You get a miracidia. Miracidia evolves to sporocyst. Sporocysts evolve to radiae. Radiae revolve into a cercari. Cercari can now get out of the body of the uh, snail to infect the fish and we continue. This is the Paragonium aswistermani. As you can see, it is allows to stay in the lungs and, and making cystic cavities in the lungs and they can come out with the feces as embryonated eggs and the life time life cycle continues. And if you eat the ad adequately cooked crustaceans, these inadequately cooked crustaceans can lead to cause you to have the infections of Paragonimus westermani if they are infected. Right, so um, that's all I wanted to share with you today. And if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat, we finish up and then I can let you go. But remember you have, I had shared with you the Atlas before the book that you should be able to, uh, to read through and get to know more details about. If you did not get the copy of the book, you can ask for your class representatives. I think Haimesh has a copy of that book. Uh, it's an Atlas. I can also send it here again in case you didn't see it so that you're able to, um, to sort of an electronic Atlas for parasitology. Uh, it will help you uh, help. It's about 17 megabytes, so it's coming through. All right, um, this is it. Tell me if you get it and then I'll end the call.